It's the 14th anniversary of the first peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin transaction, which occurred between Bitcoin creator Satoshi Nakamoto and early Bitcoin contributor Hal Finney, pictured here for 10 BTC. Joining us now to discuss is Jimmy Sung. He's a Bitcoin developer and author of Thank God for Bitcoin, the Creation, Corruption and Redemption of Money. Jimmy, always great to have you on the show. So tell us what happened on January 11th, 2009 and the significance it holds today. Well, January uh, 11th was, I, I believe, uh, you know, a, a block that uh, that contained the very first transaction. Um, most likely that was the very first transaction. It's possible that some other transaction was on the network, but nobody mined it in a block or something like that. But th this was the re first recorded transaction and it happened between Satoshi Nakamoto and Al Finney. And, you know, if you look at the comments and stuff, it's, it was clear it was just sort of like a test thing. And back then it was uh, based on IP addresses and so on, which, uh, which uh, isn't used anymore. Uh, but it, w it was significant in the sense that it proved that you could transfer Bitcoin from one person to another. Uh, pr prior to that, it was all just mining. The only way you could get Bitcoin was by mining it. Of course, there weren't that many people on the network. So uh, you had a very good chance if you were running it on your laptop. So um, the, the momentous thing about this particular transaction is that it was the very first uh, and certainly not the last of any transactions that Mm -hmm. What's also significant is that we it was done by Hal Finney. A lot of said has said been said about Hal Finney, and uh, reflecting on him, who was Hal Hal Finney, and why do you think he was the first one to receive this transaction? Well, Hal Finney uh, was a cypherpunk, and not just uh, sort of like any cypherpunk. There there were lots of different groups with. Punk movement. Um, I, I'm sure you're aware of who Julian Assange is. He was a cypherpunk. Mark Andreessen was a cypherpunk. Adam Back was a cypherpunk. Nick Saba was a cypherpunk. Uh, but how Finney came into the um, cypherpunk mailing list sort of from a libertarian perspective. And he, want, he recognized very early on, um, you know, pretty much since the list's inception, that uh, some sort of money outside state control was going to be a, an important part of uh, creating a more free society. And, and he worked on a lot of different uh, sort of ways to do that. And he was always sort of thinking about it. And he came up with something called reusable proof of work, which was run on sort of provable hardware. And it was, uh, it was an experiment, and you can go read about it on nakamotoinstitute.org if you're interested. Uh, but he had this uh, system of transfer based on reusable proof of work that he had created. It didn't really work because, uh, you know, there, there wasn't a, a standard for the proof of work yet. And, you know, how, how do you make sure that you don't get sort of infinite printing. It turns out that uh, difficulty adjustment is a is a key factor to that. Uh, but he he was somebody that was very much interested in creating some sort of digital scarcity, a digital money, if you will. Uh, and when uh, Satoshi Nakamoto came along and created Bitcoin, he was you know he was well positioned to be very very curious about it because he. Had pursuing this goal for something like 15, 17 years. Uh, and when, when he saw it and he, he got into it, um, I, I think uh, Satoshi saw someone that was credible within the cypherpunk community to uh, sort of show that this could actually work and that he can, you can transfer Bitcoins from one person to another. And uh, yeah, that that's probably the significance. Uh, there there were lots of other people on the net. Well, not lots, but a few people, a few other people on the network that weren't as well known as Hal, and uh, and they didn't get <laughs> the first transaction despite that being on there. Finney is commonly suspected to have invented Bitcoin just because uh, it's often that. The people who invent their projects are often the first users of their projects. Uh, any thoughts into that? I know you hate speculating on this topic. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I really don't think it was him. Uh, just, uh, you know, there, there have been multiple emails released between him and Satoshi. That would be sort of, that's not the sort of thing that you do to cover up your tracks. Uh, not, not many people think to do stuff like that. Uh, um, the way he was, uh, uh, like, just the way he presents himself and stuff. Um, he was very mm -hmm. open about reusable for work. I, I don't see why he uh, hit himself for a Bitcoin had he invented. So um, just doesn't Shortly. seem like... Yeah, shortly after uh, receiving that coin, he was diagnosed with ALS and unfortunately died from that illness. Um, he did predict that Bitcoin would be worth $10 million a coin one day. Uh, it's still chugging along. But I want to ask you, reflecting on the period of time we find ourselves in uh, the crypto world with the downfall of Terra Luna, crypto lenders, Celsius, uh, Voyager, the Arrows Capital, FTX now, uh, wobbles at DCG and Genesis. What is Bitcoin's message in all of this? Well, I, I think all of those things are sort of corruptions of the pure thing that is Bitcoin. And I, I've said this to you before on the show. Um, you know, the, the conflation between these two uh, worlds of altcoin and Bitcoin, that, that's, uh, you know, I mean, Hal's probably rolling in his grave because of all of, all of that. Um, you know, the reason why Terra Luna and Celsius and other things are in trouble or have gone bankrupt is because they're not using sound money. They're, they're using the, some old corrupt financial choices of Wall Street rather than, you know, using honest money, which Bitcoin is. And, you know, until we have a clear separation between these two things, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to necessarily improve on any of this stuff. Uh, the, people need to understand that Bitcoin is sound money and all of this other stuff is just fiat games. Uh, it's fiat 2.0. Um, all coins are fiat 2.0. And until that's really understood by people and really sort of captured and embraced, um, you know, we're, we're going to have more of these tragedies, more of these people losing money, more of these people losing their shirt. I mean, this clearly isn't the first time. We had stuff like BitConnect and, you know, Pirate mm -hmm. 40 before that. Uh, the other scams and every cycle you you get these things because people don't understand the difference between bitcoin and altcoins and to be quite frank christine uh, your publication <laughs> the company that you work for is ha has something to do with that right the the fact that you cover all of these things in sort of like a big bundle and pretend that they're all in the same industry and bitcoin is leading this rally or they're following this rally like they, they have nothing to do with each other as far as I'm concerned. And from a freedom perspective, from a moral They're perspective. They're definitely different communities, people. different different networks and everything. But yes, we do cover the gamut of the crypto industry, blockchain, Web3, et cetera.